Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Research Podcast from Georgia State University. You can find this episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Google Play. In each episode, we will highlight interesting and innovative research happening at Georgia State in areas ranging from astronomy to history to biomedical sciences. We will feature a different faculty member and a different topic each month, so you can learn more about research taking place across the university. I'm Jennifer Rainey Marquez, your host and Associate Director of Research Communications at Georgia State. My guest in this episode is Dr. Michael Erickson, the university's interim vice president of research and the founding dean of the School of Public Health. Dr. Erickson has spent many years researching smoking and tobacco regulation. He helped develop the country's tobacco control policy while serving as the director of the CDC's Office on Smoking and Health. And today we're going to be talking about a modern public health concern, e-cigarette use, otherwise known as vaping. So, Let's talk for a minute to get started about the trend in tobacco use before the introduction of e-cigarettes. Anybody who's seen Mad Men knows that smoking was widespread in the middle part of the 20th century. So what happened after that? Well, the transition from the 50s and 60s has just been almost unimaginable. Uh, Cigarettes were advertised on television. Uh, The Flintstones promoted it. It was um, the norm. Uh, Mad Men represented it, but uh, over 50% of men smoked in 1964 at the time of the first Surgeon General's report, and about 35% of women smoked. And so it was socially acceptable. Smoking occurred everywhere. Uh, Today, rates have dropped from uh, nearly 50% down to approaching 10% uh, of adults who smoke. And progress has been almost unimaginable, but it's taken 50 years for the rates to come down to where they are today. Um, So there's been a dramatic change, and uh, I can see the day when smoking um, is almost uh, invisible and um, a very rare habit. When I see people smoke today, I, I, I look at it and say, God, that really is kind of bizarre to see someone burning a product and inhaling it into their lungs, it still exists. Um, Over 30 million Americans continue to smoke, but the profile of today's smokers is quite different than it was 50 years ago. And how how is it different? Well, 50 years ago, uh, physicians smoked, um, well-educated people smoked, everybody smoked. Um, It was culturally acceptable. Today, it's um, almost Um, seen almost as a deviant behavior. And the people who uh, have the highest rates of smoking are um, the unemployed, uh, people who have dropped out of school, um, people with what we call our comorbidities, uh, either uh, mental health problems or uh, addictions of other types. Now that doesn't mean everyone who smokes uh, has those conditions, but the majority of smokers do. We estimate actually that two thirds of smokers in America today uh, either are unemployed or without health insurance or low educational levels or have uh, mental health or substance abuse problems. So the profile of of who smokes is, is totally different and the implications of how you reach today's smokers uh, changes dramatically. And Mm -hmm. and in many ways, it's a harder to reach group because um, uh, of of some of the um, characteristics I described. And what about smoking among young people, teenagers? How has that changed? Uh, The smoking among uh, young people is even more interesting than uh, among adults in that it's changed more rapidly uh, in a very positive way. When I was director of the Office on Smoking and Health uh, at CDC, about a third of high school seniors smoked uh, every day. And that was in what year? Uh, the mid-90s. Okay. And it was at the time the Joe Camel campaign was launched, and it was a very purposeful effort by R.J. Reynolds to um, engage uh, young white males and, and the smoking franchise. 
Um, and I know this very well because I was an expert witness for the Federal Trade Commission against uh, the Joe Camel campaign. So I saw documents that were just appalling about their efforts to recruit uh, young people to begin smoking. Um, and, and that uh, rates in the 90s um, have plummeted to today where less than 10% of uh, high school students smoke cigarettes, and no one could have imagined that type of progress. It's one of the few uh, national health objectives that have been met, which was to get uh, teen smoking rates under 12%, and now we're in single digits. So the progress on smoking has been huge, um, but now it's in jeopardy. Right, and let's talk about the introduction of e-cigarettes like Juul, how has that changed things, particularly when we're looking at rates among young people? Well, the uh, introduction of e-cigarettes has uh, really changed the tobacco control environment in, in ways that were almost unimaginable. Uh, the introduction of Juul, which is a very innovative product that ha does things that no other uh, electronic product has ever done has been cataclysmic in terms of its effect on this country and particularly among teens in, in ways that are, you know, I have to say almost unimaginable in terms of the uptake that's occurred among teens and the panic that's, that's occurred among teachers and parents and policymakers uh, at a time when traditional smoking rates have gone into single digits, the uh, vaping rate um, almost exclusively with Juul is around 20% of teenagers. And everyone's struggling to try to figure out how do we stop this epidemic? Uh, what are the implications of it? And, and what can be done? What is it about a product like Juul that is fueling this sort of epidemic, as you call it, among young adults or, or teens? It starts with the product itself. Um, and, and Juul was designed in a way that it would deliver nicotine in a way no other product could other than cigarettes. All of the other electronic products uh, use liquid nicotine and Juul use what are called nicotine salts, which um, uh, it gets to be fairly technical around pH and absorption in the body but they designed a product that was much more addicting um, and pro delivered nicotine much more efficiently and rapidly than other products, any other electronic product was number one. And number two, they designed it so it would look cool. It it's, it's a, uh, resembles a flash drive. Um, it looks like a Apple product. It has a, a chrome covering with lights on it. It's easy to use and it's also easy to hide. Mm -hmm. And so what actually has turned out is that kids in school are surreptitiously using um, a Juul products almost as a game to use it in the classroom and use it in the bathroom. Teachers are unaware and parents were unaware that the product even existed, um, no less could be used without them knowing about it, with the net effect that many kids actually um, became addicted to nicotine to the point where they couldn't stop using it and the, no one actually knew what was going on. And there was also a pretty robust and pretty slick marketing campaign also happening that's very different from what people are used to seeing and what's allowed today with cigarettes, right? Yeah, it begins with that. If, if you were born after 1970, you've never seen a tobacco product advertised on television or radio or any broadcast media because it was banned by the government. Uh, the same rules don't apply to e-cigarettes and particularly Juul. So for the first time in people's lifetimes, including particularly kids, teenagers, they can see a product advertised um, not only on television, which uh, kind of just is emblematic of the problem, but the real issue was the uh, very clever way that Juul used social media uh, to um, get the message out that using Juul was um, cool and desirable. 
So, so Juul, the company, uh, did some things right in that they designed a product that mimicked smoking like no other product and provided nicotine in a way that would satisfy smokers. And, and they say the intent was to provide an alternative to smokers to get them off the harm of smoking and provide a better way of getting nicotine that wasn't as harmful. But that product they decided to market in a way that very clearly appealed to kids. Uh, they used Instagram and Twitter and other types of social media with young appealing models in a way that actually um, mimicked what the tobacco companies did decades before and also encouraged uh, postings on social media of, of kids using Juul surreptitiously. And so it became kind of a contest about you know how you can Juul without people catching you. Mm. Um, so they did everything wrong in terms of what they say they intended to do, which is was to have a product for smokers. They actually uh, marketed it in a way that hit the sweet spot for teens. And, and the effect of that um, we're, we're dealing with now, much to their dismay, because it's really uh, uh, spoiled the well uh, of what they say they intended to do. They've actually now just recently had, you know, appear before Congress and try to defend their product and the prospects of the product being regulated, perhaps even out of existence. One other thing you mentioned to me before that I thought was interesting was this idea that when you, if you're a high school student and someone offers you a cigarette and you inhale, that you're going to start coughing, you might throw up even, that there's this sort of aversive effect, but that it's not the case with e-cigarettes. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, the, the whole way... Um, that smoking worked traditionally and historically was that uh, by smoking a cigarette, uh, there was an aversive um, immediate effect from the smoke and the carbon monoxide that make people cough or get dizzy um, uh, from the uh, inhalation. And, and sometimes that if you persevered, you got used to it. And sometimes people would just stop because it was so aversive uh, with Juul. There's no smoke. It's just inhaling a uh, uh, pure nicotine, um, which doesn't have the same aversive uh, effects that the inhaling the smoke did. So it's also um, easier to use and, and unfortunately easier to get addicted. Do we know whether kids are starting out with vaping and then going on to smoke traditional cigarettes? That's a um, really Im important question and one that is still being debated. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that the evidence uh, suggests that that is happening. Um, you know, the question is that people saying that um, uh, these are people, kids who would have smoked otherwise and that um, using Juul. Some of them will continue to use Juul. Some of them will go on to smoking, but they would have smoked otherwise. But there's pretty good evidence that kids who would have never smoked are attracted to the marketing and the product and um, the uh, ability to do something that's uh, undetectable. And there's, there's a big concern that not only will there be a continuing level of addiction to nicotine among young people that was beginning to be eradicated, but that kids who would never have uh, smoked at all are picking up Juul and then are progressing to um, cigarettes. It's, it's hard to really know the full picture because it's, a, it's only been around for two years. Mm -hmm. But it, it's very, um, very concerning. So based on everything you just said, it seems pretty clear that there needs to be some kind of regulation. Um, why is it so hard for the FDA to figure out the right way to go about this? Well, um, first of all, to say is that the company, Juul, understands the uh, harm and risk associated with the product being used by young people 
as opposed to how they intended it to be used purportedly by adults, um, and that it threatens their whole multi-billion dollar industry, tens of billions of dollar industry. They estimate the value at 30 billion. So they've taken some steps to uh, try to mitigate um, the attraction of the product to young people. Whether they're sufficient or not, time will tell. But the larger point is, is that, well, what is the government doing? Uh, what type of regulations are put in place? The FDA, uh, the former commissioner of the FDA, was very explicit that he wanted to both regulate electronic products to make sure that they are as less harmful as possible, but also um, to allow them to be on the market as alternatives for smokers because there's not, they're not as bad as smoking. And to strike that balance of, of how do you um, allow products to be available and that, but that they are used by smokers as opposed to by kids. So the dilemma now is how do you keep Juul and other e-cigarettes out of the hands of kids but make them available for adults who may want to use them to try to help them quit smoking, which is not even clear that they do, but they have that potential. And since smoking kills more people than any other reason in this country, having alternatives that might be helpful is important. You don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, essentially. Right. right. So what do we know about how adult smokers are using these products? Let me say, before getting into that, just I'll put back on the issue of uh, government regulation and mm -hmm. what they can do. Um, some of the options that are being considered uh, is banning flavors because um, flavors are very important um, for kids um, and starting to use electronic products and, and flavors range from cotton candy to uh, menthol and, and myriad of flavors, hundreds if not thousands of flavors. Juul um, has limited the flavors that are available in retail outlets um, because of all the criticism. Um, and the FDA is trying to decide what they should do about regulating flavors, um, including banning flavors if that they are outright. outright. Um, and so that's that's one of the things they're considering. Um, and uh, other regulations around access and how they could be purchased um, and whether they should even be allowed to be in stores as opposed to being purchased simply online. So there, there are a number of regulatory considerations that the FDA um, uh, is looking at uh, to try to make them available for adults, but to keep them out of the hands of kids. Mm -hmm. uh, even even going as far as looking at technology, these Juul products are Bluetooth enabled, uh, if you can believe it, and that there's the possibility of putting up uh, electronic fences around schools so that the product could be disabled. Um, by through, the company. By the company. When you enter one of these fenced Inside off fence, areas. Right. Interesting. Using, and so there, there's a, a myriad of um, regulatory options that are being uh, looked at. Um, and the company clearly understands that this is um, uh, an incredible risk for the even the viability of the company with the um, preference of... of uh, Jewel among kids rather than adults, mm -hmm. or in addition to adults. Um, in terms of uh, uh, smoking cessation for adults right. with um, these products, uh, again, uh, uh, it, it's a highly debated area as to whether they're effective or not. Um, there really is no debate that electronic products, including Jewel, are less harmful than smoking. Everyone agrees with that, every public health authority and every scientist. They may argue about how less harmful, and some people say 95% less harmful, and some people say half as harmful. Can you briefly explain, for people that don't really understand the difference of how an electronic cigarette works versus how a traditional cigarette works, why is it less harmful? Yeah. 
um, traditional cigarettes um, uh, are harmful because uh, 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 organic product, tobacco leaves, are uh, combusted, uh, or as um, Commissioner Gottlieb said, set on fire. And uh, in that process of combustion, um, carcinogens and other toxins like benzene and formaldehyde are created. Um, and then that is inhaled into the lungs. Um, and so there's, they estimate there are 4,000 different compounds, 70 carcinogens that are created through the process of combustion in order to get the nicotine. Now the nicotine in and of itself isn't that harmful. It is a cardiovascular stimulant, and uh, um, but the, the deaths caused by smoking are primarily associated with the byproducts of combustion. Electronic products don't combust, they heat um, either liquid nicotine or um, uh, in Jules' case, nicotine salts and new products may have tobacco, they're called heat not burn products and, and they heat tobacco, but they don't combust it. With the net effect being that there aren't all of the combustion products get inhaled by the person and the person basically inhales nicotine vapor and other chemicals. And, and, and it's important to get the point across that it's not safe in any way, shape or form. It's just less harmful. And as a society and as a public health community, we've had a hard time communicating that difference that um, less harmful doesn't mean safe. Uh, but if you're smoking, you'd be much better quitting entirely um, and vaping than continuing to smoke. But what about if you're doing both? Unfortunately, <laughs> that's what's happening. Uh, so our research at Georgia State, uh, we, we've received funding from the Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration to study this very issue of um, novel use of novel tobacco products. And what we found is that um, uh, smokers who try vaping, um, the, the, the most common outcome a year later is that they're doing both. Um, there are some um, uh, give up smoking and just vape. Some uh, reject vaping and continue to smoke. But the most common response is to continue to smoke and to vape, which is like the worst outcome. Why is that the worst thing you can do? Well, you're getting all the harm from smoking and you're getting the nicotine from vaping. And there's some scientific evidence showing that there is more adverse health effects from that, primary respiratory conditions. But it also is providing more nicotine, which is gonna make people more addicted and probably less likely to quit because they're getting accustomed to having higher doses of nicotine half from their cigarettes and half from their electronic product. Because the e-cigarette delivers a stronger dose. The, the Juul does particularly, but what you're doing is basically getting two doses, two sources, um, but it's still, we're, we're the infancy of, of research. Some people feel that dual use is what we call both smoking and vaping at the same time, that that will help people transition into just vaping but that still needs to be shown. Our, our data um, just shows that people after a year, um, the most common outcome is that they're doing both. They're continuing to smoke and vape. Um, I think there's promise and there are studies that show um, that vaping can help people stop smoking if it's uh, part of a systematic program that includes counseling and education about um, transitioning from smoking to vaping. And somewhat ironically, the people who are most likely to quit smoking by vaping are people that use that vape every day because they really do need to substitute um, one source of nicotine for another. One of the issues that we need to consider long-term is, you know, um, are we in favor of lifetime vaping um, or should the goal be to transition from smoking to vaping for a period of time and then to get off vaping and be nicotine free. Right, because you mentioned nicotine is, it's not necessarily what is killing you. You're not dying of lung cancer because of nicotine, but it's not 
without harm entirely. Right. I, I mean, some people argue that um, we shouldn't care what people do. It's their decision, kind of a libertarian perspective. But I think um, most public health people and, and most parents and most people would prefer um, their kids and their family not be addicted to any product and have a health-promoting lifestyle where they don't need to supplement mm -hmm. it with some type of chemical that's a stimulant um, and has some adverse cardiovascular effects, um, but it's not as bad as smoking. So it really is some interesting you know, philosophical and social issues as well. My feeling as, as being involved with this for, for years is the goal would be to transition people away from nicotine entirely. Um, but if people were, as long as they give up smoking, um, I'd be satisfied as well. You spoke a little bit about the possibility that the FDA could ban flavors. If you were in charge of regulation, what else do you think are some of the easy wins or, or that you would do? Well, the, the one that's getting the most attention is, is um, restricting flavors, either all flavors or most flavors, or those flavors that are most popular for kids. And, and, and again, that's tricky because adults like flavors too. And so how do you determine which flavors to restrict or should you just take all flavors away and, and, and uh, um, the importance of that? The, the other strategy that's moving forward fairly quickly is to raise the age of purchase, a uh, minimum age of purchase. Uh, right now in Georgia, um, and uh, you know, I've, a few years ago and everywhere, it was 18. Mm -hmm. Now there's an effort to raise it to 21. Um, and that's happened, and uh, I understand now, and the majority of, um, the, for the majority of the U.S. population live in states or local areas where you have to be 21 to buy any type of tobacco product, including e-cigarettes. So that's another effort the FDA um, uh, could support. And what's happening is there are bills in Congress to do that, as well as the most of the action, though, is, is by uh, state and local jurisdictions. And then it goes from there in terms of um, some products that are uh, uh, can be banned. The FDA is, has the authority to not allow the sale of certain products if they don't get FDA approval and the companies have to submit to the FDA uh, documentation that the products uh, have a net public health benefit, that more people will uh, benefit from it than be harmed by it. And that, that process is, um, is basically referred to as pre-market approval. And, and the FDA uh, is in the process now of implementing a timeline and regulations that all vaping products have to go through this pre-market approval. The, the real conundrum here is that that doesn't apply to cigarettes. And so the cigarettes that are on the market, which are the most harmful products, don't have to do anything and they're allowed to continue on the market. And so it's kind of messed up. Uh, from a public policy standpoint, our, our regulatory mechanisms uh, in this country are not uh, nimble. They take years because of, um, ironically, part of the desire of getting public input and allowing periods of public comment and then evaluating those comments extends the period of regulation. And so the net effect of it is um, there are, there are challenges that are going on that are harmful, that can't be changed. Uh, and that's why Congress is starting to investigate because Congress um, and, and the legislative process doesn't have to go through the same hurdles that a regulatory process can do. They can pass a law that take effect immediately where FDA as an executive branch has to go through the regulatory process, which can take years. Right. I also wanted to bring up a new type of device that we may be seeing. Um, earlier this year, the FDA approved the sale of a new type of e-cigarette-like product called iQOS, I-Q-O-S, which is made by Philip Morris. How is iQOS different from Juul? 
Good question. Um, so ICOS is a product that was uh, developed by Philip Morris International, which is the company that sells Marlboro everywhere in the world except in the United States. In the U.S., it's sold by Altria. Um, and there's a long history of corporate um, um, uh, spin-offs and things like that. But this product, ICOS, is called a, um, uh, a heat not burn product. Uh, and so rather than um, uh, electronic cigarettes, which um, heat liquid nicotine and create an aerosol of nicotine, ICOS uh, actually has tobacco pods that are heated that provide more of a tobacco and smoking feel to it. Um, with more tobacco flavors that appeals to smokers because they capture some of that aroma and other uh, sensory aspects of it. And that product, um, it, it's estimated that Philip Morris International has spent up to $10 billion to develop this product. It's being rolled out globally. Uh, it's been in countries like Japan and Korea for a number of years and has surpassed expectations in terms of market share that these countries have adopted this product as an alternative to smoking. It's still a little unclear as to whether it's replaced smoking or again, people are doing both, but there seems to be more switching to ICOS in these countries. Philip Morris International um, had applied a few years ago to sell it in the U.S. and uh, the FDA um, did not approve it until a few months ago. They've allowed the company through Altria, which is the U.S. version of Philip Morris, to sell uh, ICOS in the U.S. So it'll be another product like Juul and like other e-cigarettes, another alternative for smokers to get a um, non-combustible product, hopefully to allow them to transition from smoking to something that's not combusted. So, th so that product will be introduced in the U.S. shortly. And I understand that it's going to be test marketed in Atlanta, probably starting later this month. Yes, uh, and I, I, you know, it's all very interesting, and, and and I don't think it's being test market in Atlanta because of me, but it's ironic that um, it is test marketed in uh, the city that is the headquarters of the American Cancer Society, the Centers for Disease Control, um, and a lot of tobacco researchers, including those at Georgia State. Um, so Atlanta is the single city test market. Um, the last we heard, it may be either August or September, um, where it will be rolled out uh, in Atlanta. They are creating a store that is um, will be devoted to the sale of ICOS. A freestanding um, store. A freestanding store that will be like an Apple store, where people will go in and be able to see the product, have people explain to them how it works, have demonstrations on how it's better than smoking, and the store will be in Lenox Mall. Wow. So the intent is to go to an upscale audience and to really kind of um, hit those people who are um, can afford the product, who are often seen as innovators, and that may um, demonstrate how the product can be used so that others will then, it's, it's a part of diffusion theory, that if you get the... Um, uh, uh, people that um, are, are innovators and serve as role models, other people will see it and may adopt it. Thank you very much. This has been the research podcast from Georgia State University featuring Dr. Michael Erickson, Interim Vice President for Research and Founding Dean of the School of Public Health. For more conversations about research taking place across Georgia State, look for the research podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Thank you so much for listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And thank you again, Dr. Erickson. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>